Well, today we will take up uh, the fourth aspect of the mother, the aspect of Maha Saraswati. Let me read a couple of lines before we go into the details. Maha Saraswati is the mother's power of work and her spirit of perfection and order. The youngest of the four, she is the most skillful in executive faculty and the nearest to physical nature. Maha Maheshwari lays down the large lines of the world forces. Mahakali drives their energy and impetus. Mahalakshmi discovers their rhythms and measures. But Mahasaraswati presides over the detail of organization and execution, relation of parts and effective combination of forces, and unfailing exactitude of result and fulfillment. Well, that's the general introduction to this fourth aspect which is interestingly described as the youngest of the four and of course someone does catch the mother on this question how is it that she is the youngest of the four and uh, so there is an answer here That's on page 110 in this book, if you have this book, 110. So after reading the first couple of lines, the mother explains, in the order of manifestation, she was the last. It's a very interesting thing, how Mahasaraswati is the last, but we'll see, she explains this. And in her special nature, in the quality of her vibration, she is very close to even a little child. She likes young people, children, things in the making, which have a long way before them to be transformed and perfected. She likes the activities of the young. She is the youngest in nature and the last to manifest. We have two things here. One is she is very close to the young people. So I think many of us or most of us here may not be qualified for that. So young at heart. Well, not only young at heart as she says, making it clear which have a long way before them to be transformed and perfected. So not only young at heart, but your body and vital and mental also should be ready to be transformed because she wants to transform and she wants to see as a work. However, there are two things, as I said, one is the, her closeness to the young and, and the children. And she is the youngest in nature and the last to manifest. So that's interesting that how she is the last to manifest and for that I think we have an explanation here from Sri Aurobindo who says Maheshwari lays down the large lines of the world forces, Mahakali drives their energy and impetus, Mahalakshmi discovers their rhythms and measures, but Mahasaraswati presides over the detail of organization and execution relation of parts and effective combination of forces, an unfailing exactitude of result and fulfillment. So if you can imagine uh, any work that is uh, undertaken, you see, we, let's take the example of, uh, of an architect. Before he starts on a project, we have the famous uh, example of Roger Angers himself. 
I mean, we have seen his correspondence with the mother and his talks with the mother. How for hours together they would first discuss and uh, see what would be the, the concept. What Shravindu says, the large lines of the world forces. So it's obviously always the concept, concept precedes. So once that concept is given, then comes the next line of action. So similarly, there's a kind of a sequence of happening. First the concept comes in, then Mahakali drives their energy and impetus, then Mahalakshmi discovers their rhythms and measures. You see, this is all stage of the, slowly they are getting manifested from the extreme subtle level of idea, or what Shravinda calls the real idea. Then slowly as an architect first conceives the plan, then he would call in the workers and say, hey, each one of you, the carpenter, the mason, the contractor and all that. Then the third level, really the material, the sand and the bricks and all of them are there bought and put in position. So you see, the idea goes through phases and stages before it comes down onto the physical material level. So similarly, in the, in the making or in the manifestation of this universe, Maheshwari is obviously the first one because she gives you the concept, the idea. Then Maheshwari gives the energy. Mahalakshmi sort of, you know, further gives the details of the plan in what measures, in what way, and in what time. And ultimately, when it comes down to the physical level, there is Mahasaraswati. So that's why in the sequence of manifestation itself, Mahasaraswati is last. Because manifestation on the material level comes as the last point. So following this sequence, she is definitely the last. So we have that uh, last stage. And also, there's another interesting detail that she, Mahasaraswati, presides over the detail of organization and execution. See, now we understand. In one place I read, uh, I don't remember now where, where the mothers would say, the more you get into the details of organization, the more there is the possibility of that thing becoming a reality. So that's why in any project, you should work out to the last details. So when you come to the last details, we see exactly that's the aspect of Saraswati, Mahas Saraswati, detail of organization and execution. So if you leave a concept midway saying, okay, it should be like that, it ought to be like that, then the things of manifesting it are lesser. So now I can understand why the mother was having this indefinite sessions with Roger Andre and other people concerned to really point out what would be Matri Mandir in exact detail. In fact, as all of us know, she has even given the, the measurement of the base of, uh, of Matri Mandir, how many meters the width, how many meters the radius and all that. So it is very interesting to see that mother really gave the, the meters, how many meters. Normally, one would have left saying, oh, it should be a place like that. Of course, uh, we all know, we have read it in the in, in Oroville uh, literature by the mother, that uh, she insisted on the inner chamber and she seems to have told Roja, the outer form, I don't mind, whatever you people think it. So she was wanting to see, because she had visualized and envisioned and seen the inner chamber, so she gave the ultimate details of the inner chamber so that that chamber gets manifested according to her will and wish. Whereas the outer is a sphere or Roger Ange went with an idea of a, what in India we call the, the egg of Brahman, the whole shape was in the shape of an egg and, uh, and so all kinds of shapes were invited. So she was not very much particular about the outer. So what I want to say is, that mother's execution, we see this aspect immensely. And of course, uh, I'll read out a few uh, I mean, other instances where this aspect of Mahasaraswati 
is very prominent in the working of the ashram. You see, if she really presided over the making of the ashram, it is this aspect that is most important. And that's what she wanted to do with Oroville, but uh, Oroville being very new, she could not perhaps uh, lead it on a day-to-day -day level. She gave mostly what in our language we would see the Maheshwari aspect, not more, more the Mahasaraswati aspect, with details of organization and execution. No, I'm sorry, Mahalakshmi aspect with rhythms and measures. And a very few details of the organization and execution because she left it for the future of Oroville because Oroville itself has to evolve and uh, go through the time phases. So, she left it to the bosom of the future. But in the ashram, she had all the time to go into the details. So, we have, uh, I have brought you a lot of examples to see what are these details. I will take them up a little later. Let me go through one more uh, reading. Uh, again on uh, page 187 of this volume, on the, the mother with the mother's comments, on page 187, there is an interesting conversation. What do Maha Saraswati and Maha Lakshmi look like? What? What do they look like? My child, you must see them. When you see them, you will know. The aspect is different in each case, according to the people to whom she shows herself, according to the work she does not the one seen in this body. Are the images we see of Maha Saraswati true? Oh Lord, laughter. When a very small child tries to make someone's portrait, does it resemble that person? It is very much like this. Sometimes worse, because the child is frank and sincere, Whereas the one who makes the images of the gods is full of fixed notions and preconceived ideas. Or else of all that others have said about the subject and of what has been written in the scriptures and what has been seen by people. And so he is bound by all that at times from time to time. There are artists who have an inner vision, a great aspiration, a great purity of soul and, and of vision, who have made things which are reasonably good. But this is extremely rare. And generally, I believe it is almost the opposite. I have seen some of these forms in the vital and mental worlds which were truly human creations. There is a force behind, force from beyond which manifests. But in these triple worlds of falsehood, truly man has created God in his own image, more or less. And there are beings which manifest in forms which are the result of the formative thought of man. And here you see, it is truly frightful. I have seen some of these formations. Silence. And all this is so obscure, so incomprehensible, inexpressive. Some of the gods are more ill-treated than others. For example, that poor Mahakali, you know, what things are done to her. It is so frightful. It is unimaginable. But this form lives only in a very low world. Yes, in the lowest world, vital. And what it possesses of the original being is something. A reflection so remote from the origin that it is unrecognizable. However, usually, it is this 
that is attracted by human consciousness. And when an idol is made, you see, and the priest brings down a form, when the ceremony takes place in a regular manner, he puts himself in an inner state of invocation and tries to bring down a form or an emanation of the Godhead into the idol in order to give it a power. If the priest, priest is truly a man with the power of invocation, he can succeed. But usually, there are exceptions to everything. But usually, these people have been educated in the common ideas according to tradition. And so, when they think of the Godhead whom they are invoking, they think of all the attributes and appearances that have been given to it. And the invocation is usually addressed to entities of the vital world or at best to those of the mental world, but not to the being itself. And it is these small entities which manifest in one idol or another. All these idols in some temples or even in families, some people have their little shrines, you know, in their homes and keep an image of the Godhead they worship. These entities manifest in them. Sometimes the consequences are rather unfortunate. For these forms are precisely so remote from the original Godhead that they are awkward formations. Some of those Kalis they worship in certain families are veritable monsters. I can tell you, believe me, that I have advised some people to take the statue and throw it into the Gange, in the Ganges in order to get rid of a thoroughly disastrous influence. In fact, this has succeeded very well. Some of these are unlucky presences. But this is man's own fault. It is not the fault of the Godheads. It would be wrong to put the blame on the Godheads. It is man's fault. He wants to fashion the Gods in his own image. Some who are wicked, make them still more autocratic and those who are nice make them still more nice. That is, men have magnified their own defects a little more. That is 1954. So I think uh, we have read uh, some portions of this before too. But uh, what is important we see about the, the Godheads, the forms, it is really depending on the culture and the tradition human beings have uh, imagined, sometimes caught a vital spirit, can sometimes caught a mental concept. But there are very, very few cases, as she says, depending on the person and the sculptor who could have gotten the, the true form. Well, the other thing that I would like to add is uh, Mother also would put it this way that, in fact, uh, it's there in the Gita too, that when we have a vision, a dream vision or a semi-vision in whatever manner, we see the Godhead as we believe it to be. So, a Christian would see Mother Mary in the form that they have been given in the sculptures and in the literature, whereas a Hindu would see Mother Mary as Kali or Saraswati or somebody. So, there's a lot of cultural ethos that gets into our even visions, not only imagination. And there Sri Krishna would say, why not? The divine appears to all of us as we are not used to the word is wrong, but uh, we are accustomed to in our tradition and in our culture. Because, say, suddenly we have, I see a Godhead whom I don't even recognize. Maybe it's a Greek God or a God from Africa or a God from China. So I won't kind of, you know, have that devotional spur. Whereas if I see the Godhead uh, in a form that I respect and I adore and admire, 
then immediately there's a sense of the, the gratitude, the devotion, the bhakti that comes out. So Sri Krishna would say, well, God does appear to people in the form that they would like it to be, because it is a matter of one's own individual aspiration and growth. So it is again the same thing that can be applied to Mother and Sri Aurobindo, that some of us see the dreams of Mother and Sri Aurobindo, or see them in our dreams because they appear, the divine form of the consciousness appears as the Mother and Sri Aurobindo. So, it is a kind of a secret of the world manifestation of the Shakti that she takes the forms that uh, our being adores. So now coming back to our reading, I'll take up the next uh, line. The science and craft and craft and technique of things are Maheshwari's province. So it's very interesting to see science he mentioned specifically and craft and technique of things. I mean all this question of technology and all that comes under her province. Always she holds in her nature and can give to those whom she has chosen the intimate and precise knowledge, the subtlety and patience, the accuracy of intuitive mind and conscious hand and discerning eye of the perfect worker. This power is a strong, the tireless, the careful and efficient builder, organizer, administrator, technician, artisan and classifier of the worlds. When she takes up the transformation and new building of the nature, her action is laborious and minute and often seems to our impatience, impatience slow and interminable, but it is persistent, integral and flawless. Well, when uh, I read this sentence, uh, that she is a tireless, careful and efficient builder, organizer, administrator, technician and artisan and classifier of the worlds, well, obviously, for me, as I've told you before, this aspect of the mother in the context of the ashram is uh, very obvious and nowadays we have lots of uh, books coming out which uh, give us uh, many examples of this kind of the mother looking into the building and the organizing of the ashram. Let me read out to you a couple of uh, such instances where the mother is really looking into the detail on the individual level, more on the uh, individual level materially, psychologically, spiritually, whatever level you want to call. But you see the amount of care she takes. Here I have uh, something to read out from October 2012 issue of Mother India. And uh, That's on page 845. You may note down if you have. You see, this is an article by a lady called Pramila Devi, which was uh, originally written in Bengali, but uh, subsequently translated. And we have a print of that in this issue. You see, Pramila Devi was given charge of one of the boardings in the ashram, Junjun, Junjun home. She became the guardian to look after the children, that's the background. So, she had not yet given, she had not yet been given the work, but uh, she was, I mean, told that she should be taking it up. And there was some confusion. So she, one day, she goes to Nolanira. 
That evening, I went to see Nolanida. I was a bit embarrassed because it was late. Nolanida could understand that I was feeling guilty. He was sitting in his chair, resting. On seeing me, he asked in a tone mixed with affection and authority, Why is it that you had to be called so many times today? Someone went to tell you after nine o'clock. He went once again at ten o'clock and not finding you there, he came back. I replied, No, neither. I'd come at four o'clock. You were upstairs at that time. How did you know that? Nolnida asked. When I saw your shoes at the door, I understood that you had gone upstairs to see the mother. Well, that, because I too remember, Nolnida had this uh, habit that when he went to the mother, he would always leave his slippers in front of the room. So you don't have to go and see if he's inside or call him. By seeing the slippers, you know that he's in or out of the room. So the lady says, I have seen your slippers there. So I thought, I'm sure you went up to the mother. And this is what is beautiful I wanted you to see. This pair of shoes belong to Sri Aurobindo, said Nolnida with a sweet smile, looking down at his feet. You know, uh, you have the, of course in Sakar you will see, Sri Aurobindo sitting and they have a pair of slippers. Tomorrow you will see that when you come to Sakar. And these are slippers that are called actually in Bengali Nagras. Nagras, as the note says, a kind of shoes which are open at the back. It's not a sandal, but you know, the back is open, the front is like a shoe. So Nolnida was, uh, was given a pair from Sri Aurobindo. So he says, this pair of shoes belong to Sri Aurobindo. Lowering my head, I looked at those nagras and said, they are very beautiful. Nolnida stood up. He placed both his hands on his own head and told me. Now, this is the place I wanted to see. He placed both his hands on his own head and told me, this morning, the mother gave blessings with both her hands and said, tell Pramila that I am blessing her like this for taking charge of Junjun home. Had the mother been well, she would have called you. So Nolnida is saying, now, I cannot bless you like the mother by placing my hands on your head, can I? That blessing is equal to ambrosia. Now tell me what you think. So one is, of course, Nolnida's extraordinary transparency where he says, I cannot bless you. Because the mother, and you see how beautiful the mother is placing her hands on Nolnida's hands and telling Nolnida, Tell Pramila that this is how I am blessing. She is literally showing her action. She is not just verbally telling, tell Pramila to take a Junjun home. See, that's how, I mean, this is what really touched us. And uh, I mean, you can imagine Nalnida telling so truthfully, honestly, with such great transparency and not bringing the smallest of his personal ego. He could have touched the lady's hand and said, this is how the mother blessed. But he says, no, I can't do that. So mother took care and said, tell Pramila that I'm blessing her like this for taking charge of Junjun home. And then, of course, uh, there's a question answer and Nolnida says, well, I'll tell this to the mother. That is uh, one little detail of how the mother took care of person's psychology. You see, she did not really order, as we say normally, that mother told, mother ordered. But one of these instances is that. And then you see here, I brought you a couple of uh, examples from this very latest volume called uh, More Answers from the Mother. That's a, a gem of a book, especially if you want to see mother's administration and uh, the builder, the organizer, the artisan, the classifier. Of course, you can read the whole book, but today I'm going to give you some instances where this aspect of uh, Ma Saraswati is very prominent. 